Well, statistics is a field that operates at two levels. One for itself, trying to, to develop the ideas of how one learns from experience. And at the other level, uh, it helps other fields uh, understand uh, information, how, how, uh, how information is coming in and how can it be uh, uh, compressed into something that the human mind can understand. So uh, these days, uh, enormous amounts of information are gathered, but that information isn't knowledge. It only becomes knowledge when people can understand uh, what the pictures or numbers mean. The, um, uh, so my own work in statistics has had a, been in both sides, uh, but the one that I think I'm being honored for <laughs> here, the bootstrap, is a device th that helps people analyze their own data. So typically uh, a scientist will uh, have an idea of something important to explore. Uh, uh, they run, so they collect evidence. That usually means a lot of data of one sort or another, but then it's hard to see. It, it isn't like in the movies where it's clear what the, the, what the data means. It, the, you, you try and compress it down using some maybe quite elaborate method like uh, Professor Hinton's deep learning. Uh, but then once you've done that, you still have to know how accurate that compression was. And the bootstrap is a device for uh, saying how accurate a statistic is. So typically uh, uh, you have a, a political poll and it says 54% uh, liberal, 46% uh, conservative, how accurate is that? Well, there's formulas for that, but most modern things are much more complicated than that, and the bootstrap's a way to uh, uh, understand uh, how accurate a number is. And so it's interesting that the same data that tells you something can tell you how accurate that something is. And, and so the bootstrap was that kind of thing, and that's why I was pleased with that. I've spent most of my time trying to justify the bootstrap within the confines of statistics, trying to understand what it is, how it fits into the 200-year history of statistical thinking. It has, it has to follow certain principles. How, there's a, some big principles of how one learns from experience, and I've been trying to show that it's not outside those principles, it's inside those principles. Benefits from any particular scientific or from any human thing are, it's, are hard to assess at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, statistical benefits are particularly hard to access because usually what they are is helping people understand more basic things of, of more direct interest. So uh, somebody is interested in uh, how uh, influenza is spreading and they have some method of, me of uh, measuring it and the statistician helps them understand how accurate their their method is. Well, the, the credit, first of all, should go to the people who are studying influenza, and that helps humanity, but the, the statistician is standing there helping the helpers of humanity. And that, in the long run, I think it's quite important. Uh, we, we, we live in this world of uh, uncertainty and, and a lot of challenges to what we know. And the statistics helps you s understand just how well or how poorly you un you're learning something. And I think that's a big benefit. Science is not immune to criticism, and uh, some of the criticisms are valid, and, but the criticisms are usually uh, expression of disappointment that the science isn't doing as wonderfully as everybody hoped it would. Um, the scientists make mistakes and science makes mistakes. The difference about science is that it has a self-correcting 
mechanism. Uh, nobody's satisfied with the first answer or the second answer. They keep working on it. Um, we, the, the thing about vaccines, for example, uh, that's an example of uh, people with political uh, beliefs trying to undercut what is actually rather clearly uh, established now about what's true. The vaccines work and they don't kill people. Uh, there's, there's, then there's the question, say, a more controversial thing is like climate change. Is, the, is there really climate change? Well, you could do it, you could go at it this a lot of ways, like in the United States, there's all this politics about it. You'll never get the answer that way. Only rational, careful thinking, that is scientific thinking, will ever get you there. So yes, scientists make mistakes, but I can't apologize for them. Uh, they, 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 they're the only way that you're ever going to get to the truth of anything complicated. So in my case, my father, who was a truck driver and deliverer, a smart man, uh, uh, got me interested in numbers and mathematics when I was a little boy. And he was, uh, uh, he, he worked uh, in baseball sometimes and he, we had lots of baseball statistics and that got, that got me very interested in numbers and uh, I thought I'd be a mathematician and when I got to school, Caltech, I was a pretty good mathematician, but I wasn't nearly as good as the very best mathematicians. And I realized that my talents, such as they were, uh, might lie elsewhere. And I, I went into statistics because I love the aspect of statistics of learning from experience. It's a detective game. Uh, you, you, in, in uh, the, uh, uh, classical detective story, uh, the detective figures everything out from some kind of theory. Uh, the better detective stories, there's some clues and they're slowly, you, you put the clues together and you understand what happened. And that, I love that kind of thing. Uh, uh, and um, so I went into statistics and uh, uh, it's a slow game. Uh, that is, nobody goes into statistics to be for immediate fame or uh, <laughs> a great reward, but there is fame uh, to a modest sort, and there's certainly rewards. And the, uh, the, the rewards, I'd say, uh, for a life in science generally, are, uh, if, it's almost the, it's one of the few areas where you can really use the human brain to the full uh, the, everything it can do. Of course, that's true also of writers or artists, musicians, things like that. But there's immense satisfaction. Uh, the world of science supports thinking so well. You have wonderful colleagues, you have wonderful equipment, and um, most of all, you have a tradition of clear thinking, of, of not doing the kinds of things that get, lead people wrong in everyday life, emotions, biases, political biases, religious biases. Um, that's all, that's, you just get to think whatever you want to think and your, your colleagues will tell you if you're wrong. <laughs> They'll tell you all the time if you're wrong. There's two, hints that we really are still at the beginning of the science story. And one hint is the, uh, the way things grow. Uh, uh, so nature is somehow able to build from inside. If you want a tall pole, nature will grow a tree. You can put a seed in and that one seed has all the information to make a tree. If we want to make a pole, we have to take, cut down a tree and rub off all the non-pole parts. Uh, and somehow nature knows how to build from within. And we don't know how to do that. Uh, and maybe we're getting close, but I don't think so. And the, uh, the other thing is uh, our minds. Uh, uh, somehow we've learned 
or we have the ability to put things together in a very plastic way that takes things from one part of our mind to another part. It doesn't have to be programmed into us. Uh, new things can come out of the, this. And I, I think it's the same question really of, of building from within instead of building from outside. Uh, the, nature somehow has, has a trick that we haven't learned yet of how, how to grow things. Uh, a, a bird, a tree, a human, or a mind, and I would like to see us be able to understand that much better, be able to do that ourselves. So we'll know that uh, we're really getting somewhere if somebody says, I want, a, I want a chair, and they bring you a little chair seed, and you put it on the ground, and you put some stuff on it, and a few weeks later you have a chair. Uh, then I'll be impressed. Mm -hmm.